Welcome. This is Lecture 3 for Communication 1110. In this lecture, we're going to continue with what we had in the last one in reference to looking more deeply at the material in Chapter 1 of the textbook. Last time we talked about the ancients and Plato, Aristotle, what they said about communication or rhetoric, and now we're going to move into the contemporary theories of communication. Just like a field such as psychology, there are many different theories of communication. They tend to be in one of two camps. One is the humanistic values of communication, and the other is more scientific and experimental view. The humanistic one emphasizes relationships and human experiences and tends to be somewhat theoretical. The scientific likes to take factors of communication, individual processes, study them, do experiments about them, and then crunch the numbers, do statistics, and make conclusions. I think both are valuable. And so coming to a definition and a description and an analysis, which are the three parts of this particular lecture, I'm going to try to combine the two and give you a, a, a view that would encompass both. So let's start with the definition. Communication is the sharing of meaning between two or more interactants. Now that fancy word interactants normally means people, so you can put the word people in there, but it could also be between two or more groups or two or more organizations. So that's the definition we're going to go with, but we have to unpack the definition a little bit. Sharing means, of course, in common, not one way, not unidirectional, but both directions. So what we're going to see in this lecture is that the transactional and back and forth and sharing common view of communication is very important to being successful at it. The second important word in that definition is meaning. Meaning is response to symbols. We're going to talk about symbols in a little bit uh, also. I want you to not think about meaning in terms of the dictionary, but think of meaning in terms of the personal response that people have to symbols. And obviously this could be a, a difficult part of communication. In your high school English classes, you may have learned about the difference between denotative and connotative meaning, and this these terms will be very important in this class as well. All right, now that we have defined communication, let's describe it. Let's break it down and talk about different descriptive phrases we could make. The first one is, to revisit the meaning idea, is that communication is symbolic. We use symbols to communicate. So let's talk about symbols. What is a symbol? A symbol is a picture, an item, or a set of letters or numbers that represents something else. That something else it represents does not have an inherent relationship with it. In some senses it might even seem kind of arbitrary. Now you might say, well, set of numbers, where does that come in? I would give you an example such as 9-11. Now if you say 9-11, immediately people think September 11, 2001, and the great tragedy of that day. If you say 911, people don't think the same thing, even though it's visually the same. They think calling for help. So even numbers have symbolic value. So let's talk about symbols. Symbols have four characteristics. The first one is that they are arbitrary. There is no connection between the symbol and the thing other than we have chose, chosen to use that symbol. Consequently, it is culturally determined and influenced. Now you might say, well, I don't know about this because, you know, I, I didn't agree to it. But in a sense you did because you choose to use the words. If you wanted to use different words, that would be fine, but people wouldn't understand you. Thirdly, meaning of symbols is personally influenced. Every word has denotative and connotative meaning, and the more abstract and general a word means, the more likely it is to have 
connotative meaning. For example, political words, conservative, liberal, progressive. Depending on a person's background, those have different meanings to people personally. Another example would be the word art. When I say the word art, you might see a painting, someone else might see sculpture, someone else might see dance. Based on your background, your perceptions, your experiences, each word has a slightly different mental picture in a sense or meaning or response. So a fourth characteristic of symbols is that they're open to change or negotiation. And a lot of times what a symbol meant to most people 20, 30, 40, or 100 years ago is not what it means today. I think the most common example we could give, even though this, and I don't use this to be um, controversial, but some of you may know a woman in her 50s or 60s whose name is Gay. No one names their little girl Gay today, but oh, in the 50s and 40s that was a very common name to give uh, women. But today, the name has, the meaning has changed for that word culturally. We've decided as a culture it means something else now. And there are a lot of other examples of that. So, communication is symbolic. That's the first and probably most important one I want to get across in this lecture. Secondly, communication is transactional. Think of a transaction as going into a business, you give money, they give a service or good. There's both sides. It's a transaction. And that's going to be very important in, in this class because there's a tendency in public speaking to think of it as I'm just doing it at people. But it is communication. It is transactional. There's a sharing involved. Thirdly, communication involves, is always involves a content and relationship dimension. I, this is another important uh, concept that relates to interpersonal communication but also to public speaking. Whenever communication takes place, there are ideas, thoughts, data, information being exchanged, but there's also a relationship dimension. Do the people trust each other? Do they like each other? Are there power issues, uh, credibility, belief, liking, etc.? Those two things are always going on, content and relationship. You don't want to forget that. Fourth, communication is best seen as a system of interdependent parts. And we're going to see in the next section that there are seven interdependent parts. And what it means as a system is that if you affect one part of the system, the other parts of the system are affected too. That's how a system works. So don't think of communication as an event. Think of it as a process and a system that is influenced by many factors and those influence each other. Number five, communication is complex. Johann von Goethe, a German philosopher, said, if we knew how complex communication really was, we probably wouldn't do it. And I, sometimes I have to agree with him about that. My study of communication has made me develop what I call Tucker's Law, which is, I'm trying to be kind of funny when I say this, it's like Murphy's Law. If anybody can possibly find a way to misunderstand you, they will. Sometimes I feel that way, especially in written communication where you don't have as many um, cues and the opportunity to explain. So that's why in, an, in a class that's hybrid or online, you want to be sure to communicate with your professor to be sure you understand everything because sometimes you need that. Number six, I have three statements. Communication is irreversible, unrepeatable, and um, inevitable. Okay, now what do those three words mean? Unrepeatable means that you cannot put all the factors together and make it again the same way. It's going to be different. Even if you played this lecture uh, a second time, it's not the same because you've already heard it one time, you're a different person. So it's like the old analogy of a man never stands in the same river twice. Things are constantly changing, especially in a system. Secondly, it is inevitable because it, uh, it's always happening. As some scholars have said, you cannot not communicate. Communication is always going on. 
and it's irreversible in that you can't change it. Once it's happened, it's happened. Now we can apologize or we can correct ourselves, but it still happened the first time. You can't undo it, which has its good points and bad points. The last point I want to make under this section is that there's a difference between communications with an S and communication without the S. With the S, it refers to the technological side of it, media, uh, television, etc. Without the S, it refers to the human side of it. This is a class in communication, no S. Maybe in another context you'll take one with the, with the communication with the S. Moving on to the third part of this, I want to analyze communication. I said it's a system of interdependent parts, so we want to look at the seven interdependent parts. The first one is context, and I really consider context extremely important to the communication process. And understanding your context is very important, just like understanding your audience is. Context can be historical, so, and that doesn't refer to 100 years ago, that means yesterday. Anything that's happened in the past influences communication. It can be cultural. We live in the United States. We live in the South. We live in North Georgia. We also are in the culture of an academic organization. If you're in a different kind of organization, that would influence the way you communicate. Third, it's social. We have certain social rules and norms. For example, in a class, the professors expected to do certain things. The students expected to do other things. And then, of course, there is the context of uh, the physical context. S uh, some of you may be in a class where they've rearranged the class and you're in, in groups. S most of your classes are very straightforward in rows. And the physical context can make a difference. The heat, the cold of the room, uh, the lighting, all those kinds of things influence communication. So that's context. Secondly, there are senders and receivers, which of course are the people who are involved. And the thing you want to get here is that both people are senders and receivers at the same time, not just performing one. And both are responsible for communication. The third one is the message. And if you've read chapter one, you know that he, he talks about the message. And I want to propose that messages are either very improvised, spontaneous on one end, or very scripted on the other end. Think of improvised as being you just don't have a clue what's going to come next and you don't know how to respond and you just have to make it up as you go. And scripted would be like a president or a politician reading a teleprompter. So you might say, well, where do you want us to fall in a speech? Well, I don't want you to be on the number 10 of like the president uh, reading a speech. I want, but I don't want you to be impromptu either. So I want you somewhere about seven and eight. And that's why we use outlines in this class instead of scripts. Don't want you to use a script. The fourth is channels. Channels is uh, basically visual and oral, or it can also be thought of as verbal and nonverbal, which we will address later in the class. But this is how the message gets communicated. What is the, the channel, the way that it gets there? Feedback is the fifth one. We need feedback. Feedback is sort of a loop. When we get a response from people, we know how to move on. If we don't have feedback, we just keep going and we can't self-correct in our communication or in anything. So feedback is extremely important. In public speaking, most of the feedback is nonverbal. We look at the faces and the body language of people. In some cases, it's a little more active. If you've ever heard Parliament, they, they heckle, they call names, they do things like that. It's kind of unusual for Americans. But uh, that's feedback as well. It shows that the audience is involved. But in interpersonal communication, there's constant feedback. The sixth is noise. Because we are human beings, and because communication is so complex and so many factors are involved, there's always noise. And noise can be physical noise, such as uh, a room is too hot or uh, there's somebody with a jackhammer outside. Uh, it can be internal. A person can be sick. They can be stressed, and so they cannot really listen and attend very well. It could be inherent in the message or the speaker. The speaker's doing things, monotone, not very interesting, uh, or mispronouncing words, etc., that cause problems. So there are lots of different kinds of noise. The point I want to make about noise is that a good communicator 
analyzes the potential noise factors and takes care of them, is aware of them. Is the room going to be too hot? Is the lighting not good? Being sensitive to those things so that the message can be as clearly communicated as possible. The last one is results, which of course means that something is different because of communication, either the people or the environment. I'd like to end this with a sort of an analogy. The communication is, is, is like three games, or could be compared to three games. The first game is bowling. Everybody's bowled. You know what happens in bowling. You take a big heavy ball and you roll it down the, the lane and knock down pins. The pins have no say in the matter and the bowler's job is just to knock down pins as many as he or she can. A lot of people treat communication like bowling. They do it at people and they just want to knock people down in a sense with their words or their, their attitude. That's not how I want you to think about communication. The second game would be ping pong or table tennis. A lot of fun to play and in this one it's mutual but the whole point is to win or lose. And it's very um, sort of, you know, there's rules and it's very uh, confined. You stop at a certain point. And while ping pong is more like communication because it's two-way, that's not really a good analogy. The one I would like to use is charades or Pictionary. Both of those games have basically the same rules, where you are acting out or drawing a picture of a clue to help the people on your team get that and answer it. And there's constant feedback loop, and it's all about everybody working together and winning. Everybody wins, not just in the group, not just one person. So when it comes to thinking about communication, I want you to think it more of in terms of Pictionary or Charade and not something you're doing at someone else. All right, this is the end of Lecture 3, Communication 1110.